Good evening. It is 6.30. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to call the Castle Hills City Council regular meeting to order and determine if a quorum is present. A quorum is present. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we'll start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Chief Siemens, will you lead us? Thank you, Chief. Okay, first up, we have acknowledgments and presentations. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, Chief Siemens is going to be leaving us. Moving on to bigger, maybe not necessarily better, but definitely bigger at Universal City. And uh, while we're going to miss him, we wish, we wish him the best of success in his career. And hopefully he doesn't forget about us and comes back and visit us every once in a while. We had a small gift for you, Chief. Yes, sir. If you want to say a few words, please. Mayor, can I say something? Uh, Mr. Rapp, do you want to lead that in and then we'll have the chief? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I would just like to take the time uh, to, to recognize Chief Siemens and his, his work and his time there in Castle Hills. Um, kind of prepared something in writing. I just wanted to say that Chief Siemens has been an invaluable member to the leadership team with our organization and has made tremendous impact in elevating the police department during his time as police chief. As I mentioned, um, or I will mention, uh, similar to uh, the next item with Ms. Craig, you know, Chief Siemens has raised the bar um, in the police department. I appreciate his professionalism and his dedication to law enforcement. Uh, at the city of Castle Hills, we've had some unprecedented challenges However, he is a colleague and a friend, and I'm personally glad to have had the last few years to work with him. Uh, the day he told me he was leaving, I thought he was joking with me, and, and I'm still waiting for him to tell me it's a prank. I've worked with a number of police chiefs in my career, and Chief Siemens is, is one of the best, and I'm fortunate to have worked with him, and he's uh, made me a better city manager during that time as well. So I appreciate it, Chief. Thank you, Ms. Rampley, Chief. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor, staff, uh, council, and uh, citizens. <clears throat> First, uh, thank you, CM. I appreciate that. Um, thought you were trying to teach your daughter valuable principles about not lying, but I see you toss that out the window. Uh, be careful doing that. <clears throat> uh, that said, thank each and every one of you. Um, I would ask one favor of you, council, that you don't forget where we came from. The, the dark times that we experienced here uh, would have cratered a, a, less, uh, a lesser city, and uh, I don't want to harp on those, nor have we. I think we've moved on tremendously, but I, I ask that you don't forget them so that, uh, that we're not likely to, to relive them. Um, I'm excited for Castle Hills' future. I really am. I feel good about where things are at now. Or I'll tell you a brief story, and I'm going to keep this super brief. I had, I had job opportunities that, that were uh, financially much more rewarding than the one I'm pursuing now. Back when we were in that turmoil in 2019, and there was no way I was going to leave this group back here or, or any of the staff here at, at Castle Hills um, under the auspice of looking like I might have ran out on something, and uh, we were in it together. And that, I think, is something all the adversity we have faced here has galvanized not only the, the, the city and the citizens and you folks, but this, this, uh, this organization as a whole. I can speak firsthand knowing 28 other chiefs in this area very intimately. Not another suburb has been through the adversity we've been through since in my tenure here since 2013. It doesn't exist in another suburb in Bear County. I can't speak much further than that, but I'd be, I'd be willing to, to uh, debate with anybody the uh, adversity that we've faced and, and not only faced, but overcome and are now obviously thriving, uh, thriving after. So please don't forget it. Uh, I know we won't. And I liked how we've handled it since and moved on. And um, I would ask that you give strong consideration to the internal candidates. Um, culture is what makes our department so special. It's nothing else. It sure as heck isn't myself or even my predecessor who was so great, uh, Chief Davis. What makes this thing special is the effort we put into hiring character people to be here. Um, we exhaust all avenues and spend a tireless amount of time 
doing that, even, even to uh, great pains internally when we're low or, or low staffed or something, we never compromise. But that culture is extremely fragile. I'm, I'm glad and I applaud going out. I wish we would have done that for my appointment. Um, uh, you never know when that gym's gonna be there, but I know for certain that if you, if you approve of the culture that you have now and the service that you have now, the, the can't miss is internal. Uh, it's a fragile thing. It doesn't take much to, to alter it. And before you know it, something's come undone and, and, and spiraled a little bit. So exercise caution there. I hope that I have a, an opportunity to be a part of that. It's been expressed to me that I will. Um, the city manager is a good city manager. I, I know a little bit about him. I've had six or seven in my tenure here. And uh, we all have shortcomings. We're, we're kidding ourselves if we don't recognize that. In fact, I often uh, lament that one of my greatest strengths is knowing all of my weaknesses. And that's a laundry list. That's a difficult task. <laughs> but uh, it's an important one because then I can compensate for them. The city manager has, has been good for us, good for this city, good for the community, certainly good for the staff. It's been stability, that much needed stability. It's been deference where there should be deference to subject matter experts such as uh, Louis over here or any of the other staff, finance, Nora or myself or the other department heads. And that deference goes a long way in um, unifying and uniting an organization as well, especially when it's warranted. So um, I hope that that council is able to move forward as planned, you know, earlier in this year to to secure that before somebody else does. And I don't know that that could be anything there. I just I just know that the, it's a cautionary tale. Um, I really don't have much else to add. It's been a pleasure. It's been my greatest pleasure in law enforcement serving this community. I truly mean that. It's not lip service. Uh, and doing so with the high character folks that are here, there's, there's not another group like it. Uh, I know the trials and tribulations other police departments go through. We don't have them. I know the uh, endless revolving door that is uh, greener and, and people leaving just to go to a sister agency. We don't have that here. We lose them on occasion to highway patrol or, or border patrol. And when I say on occasion, it's probably been four years since then. So um, it's the best group of folks I've ever served with. I'm honored to, and you folks are a cut above. And thank you for, for throwing your name in the hat and standing in the gap with the rest of us when things were so difficult. And to the staff, I'm going to miss you all, but I'm not going to be gone. I'll be in and out and in your lives for, for probably ever, sadly, for, for you all. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. You've been, a, you've been the steady force. You were in it a little before the rest of these folks, and you've been, you haven't wavered. And uh, I applaud you for that. Thank you for your leadership there as well. And um, all of you, continue to work in concert. Even when, you, when things don't, uh, we don't always agree or we have different points of view, no problem. The, uh, the example of professionalism is unparalleled now, and, and the city deserves that. Thank you all. Uh, staff, I love you guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Chief. Uh, before you run off real quick, I have a plaque for you. Okay, next up we have a recognition of our interim city secretary, Ms. Craig. As you may have known, Ms. Craig has been with us for much longer than any interim should be, but she was so good that we just couldn't find somebody that could replace her, and she's been with us for a while. Like, you know, we found that Ms. Craig, who's partially retired, right? Oh, you are retired. I, I didn't know. Uh, we found that Miss Craig could do more for us than somebody that was full time in some cases. So she was just been a huge uh, asset to the city and always in a great mood and willing to help. So um, having hired a city secretary, we wanted to uh, give her a little a bit of appreciation. Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to say a few words and recognize Miss Craig for essentially elevating the bar. Uh, during my tenure here, we've had uh, two city, two permanent city secretaries, 
uh, two interim. And, um, you know, when Ms. Craig was brought in in October of 2019, um, you know, minutes were behind, muni code was behind, uh, record management needed a lot of work, but, um, you know, over time, he definitely was able to um, catch us up on the minutes, start getting the muni court in order. And, um, you know, I can say at the time, you know, Ms. Craig was the right fit. I know that she was, again, uh, retired and we, were, we brought her in on the interim. Um, but when she arrived, she fit right in. Um, like I said, it developed and improved. Uh, you know, the council meeting minutes at, at the time were, were way behind. Um, so she, she put forward a process and was able to catch up and um, but phenomenal job to raise the bar. Um, you know, December, I just want to acknowledge Mrs. Craig's award she's going in. December, she received the award, the Legacy Scholarship by the Texas Municipal Clerks Association. Scholarship that recognizes retired city secretaries who continue to provide city services to cities on an interim basis. Uh, she was the first city secretary in Texas to receive the award. Later this month, she will receive her fifth LEAF certification uh, certificate from the University of North Texas through the Texas Municipal Court. Um, like I said, um, you know, her experience and professionalism has raised the bar there and it's put the pieces in place for this particular area of the organization for years to come. And, you know, we did hire a permanent city secretary, but um, he's walking into a better place than was before Ms. Craig got there. And now she's taking care of everything. And I'm blessed to have had her. And Ms. Craig, I just want to say thank you. Ms. Craig, we have a little something for you as well, if you'd like to say anything. Yes, ma'am. I want to say that I know a little something about city secretaries, nothing about their job, but uh, we've been through several of those as well. And we were in a really bad spot. And I have learned in the last couple of, well, last year and three months that um, that's not a place to be in a bad spot at. There's a lot of responsibility that comes out of that office. And uh, she has definitely brought us up to uh, the 2020s. And thank you, ma'am. It's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you, Frank. I know you were in this too, Councilman uh, Paul, uh, for early on. You've been a steady force and a good mentor and friend. Thank you. And y'all have a good city attorney, Mr. Schnall. Uh, you're one of my favorites at that firm. I like you much better than Paul. No, you're great. You've been a steady guiding force as well, and your advice is always even keel and, and delivered with the best interest of the city. Thank you, Chief. Okay, uh, with that being said, we'll proceed to the consent agenda. Um, do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. F uh, May. I move that we accept the consent agenda. I'll second that. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. May, a second by Mr. Joyce. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Council. Uh, new business. Conduct a public hearing on an application submitted by Ryan Ramey for the proposed removal of four oak trees for the construction of a new commercial structure to be located at the southeast corner of West Avenue and Northwest Loop 410, CB5006, PTPF. P-2, ABS 706, West Avenue Commercial Property. It is 650, 644, and we will open the public hearing. We have one person signed up.
for item number one. Uh, Mr. Leak, you want to wait till the agenda item? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Mr. Edens as well? Okay. Okay, if there's nobody. Uh, we will go ahead and close the public hearing at 645. Uh, okay, we'll proceed to item number two, discussion and possible action on an application submitted by Ryan Ramey for the proposed removal of four oak trees for the construction of a new commercial structure to be located at the southeast corner of West Avenue and Northwest Loop 410, CB5006, PT. PF P-2 ABS 706 West Avenue commercial property possible executive session pursuant to Texas government code 551.071 consultation with attorney. Mayor, um, we have Ryan Ramey who's the applicant on the line uh, who would like to uh, provide an overview and presentation of what they'll be doing with the project. And then we have uh, Barry Middleman who's chairman of the ARC to provide the recommendation to Okay, thank you, Mr. Rapley. Um, let's see, uh, why don't we have the citizens to be heard first and then uh, we, our speaker can make any comments as necessary. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Edens. My name is Charles Edens and I'm here as a consultant to the property owners. I signed up to speak in case there was any questions or uh, answer or make responses to any uh, uh, things that individuals might have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Edens. Mr. Lee, did you have anything to add? Okay, sir. Um, in that case, Mr. Ramey, if you wanna turn your screen on or however you'd like to proceed. Great. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Ramey. I'm, I'm calling in here from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm here with a developer, uh, Coal Valley Partners, uh, who uh, hopes to to build this project. I'm, I'm having trouble with my video, but can you can you hear me OK? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Um, so we're, we're hoping to build an 871 square foot Dutch Rose coffee. Uh, we here we go. Great. Um, took the feedback from our first meeting and created a new site plan that you see today. Uh, the committee wanted us to save tree 1093, uh, and we were able to accomplish that by adjusting the building location and, and reorienting the drive through. Uh, in the process, we lost tree 1094, which is an elm tree that it's not classified as a heritage tree. Um, the building is, is directly on top of where that tree is located. Uh, we, we removed 56 inches of heritage trees and are mitigating the tree loss by replanting 10 new trees, totally, totaling uh, 60 inches in caliber. Uh, quick note about Dutch Bros. Um, they will hire 50 people for this new store and do upwards of $2 million in sales. Uh, Dutch Bros is, is unique in that they give back to the community and, and get involved with local organizations in a way that most retailers do not. I think they're a unique uh, candidate and a unique uh, tenant to have in town because they, they are really involved with local organizations, with high schools, uh, local schools um, in the area and, um, and youth organizations. Um, we are, we're excited about this project and, and look forward to hopefully sh shepherding Dutch Bros into the Castle Hills community. Um, and I've, can answer any questions anybody may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ramey. Mr. Rapley? Uh, I think he covered everything as far as the overview and uh, of this project. Um, Mr. Middleman, as an ARC chairman, can give you the recommendations and thoughts of the committee. Uh, leave it this okay. Uh, let me start my video, okay. Uh, I'm Barry Middleman, Chairman of the Architectural Review Committee. And this was a, a very tested uh, example for our committee because of the 
uh, tree situation. There were some very nice trees on this site, uh, unusual number of heritage trees. And in our original meeting, we, we liked the idea of, of uh, Dutch Bros becoming a, uh, a Castle Hills uh, commercial building for many, many reasons. But we were a little bit uh, uncertain about uh, in our initial meeting uh, back in, in December, a little unsure about the amount of trees and which trees were being removed. And so we could all deliberate on it and suggest uh, some movement on the part of, uh, of the planners uh, for their establishment uh, tabled the motion, uh, motioned uh, and tabled until our January meeting. And I was very pleased to see that they made a major radical change in relocating, repositioning the building uh, to a spot in which they saved a really large 27 inch oak that we really wanted them to, to maintain the closest tree to West Avenue. And uh, not only did they comply to our wishes, uh, but uh, they made a major compromise. And instead of just adding uh, enough mitigated trees to satisfy the number of, of uh, uh, heritage trees that were removed, they went be beyond the call of duty. And uh, I saw that they made a tremendous amount of concession. And this is a perfect site for them. And we uh, uh, pretty much as a whole approved, approved this, this, not the development itself, but the tree preservation plan at this stage one uh, on a four to one count. And uh, we're very pleased and are welcome, welcome Mr. Ramey and uh, are privileged to be their first location in the city of San Antonio. Uh, and that's uh, uh, that's the conclusion of our conclusions of our committee. I'll answer any questions as well as I'm sure Mr. Ramey will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Middleman. Mr. Rapley. No, man. I think that concludes everything from from our perspective on staff. Um, this project will have to return to the ARC for I believe the design and uh, site. So we are targeting, hopefully, um, probably the March meeting, um, to go back to ARC, and back to city council. At that point, if we are still um, moving forward, um, Ryan can probably elaborate on the time frame for the development, um, probably over the next few months, and then hopefully breaking ground. Thank you, Mr. Rapley. I just want to add that I believe this is a step in the right direction for our city. Uh, you know, we've lost Starbucks and I think this is a great opportunity to bring another type of business in to offer uh, not only to our economic situation, but to our residents that live here, another business. Uh, and I'm sure that HEB is listening as well, that they're gonna get a benefit of having a nationwide organization that's gonna help lift the value of that shopping center. Uh, that being said, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Isbrand. Um, if I could just make, make a comment first before, sure. and then make a motion um, to expound on what you just said at the risk of showing my age a little bit. I began work at that HEB when I was 15 years old. That lot stands today as it did then empty. And throughout the course of time, it has been empty. This is an extremely unique opportunity for us to welcome a quality business to our city. I understand that nobody is ever thrilled about the removal of trees. This is a commercial area though, where again, a lot has stood empty for a long, long time. And this is an opportunity that may not come our way again. Um, given a, two, uh, a, a projected $2 million annual revenue for that company, you can, uh, for that location, you can also, also appreciate what it could do to help support the city of Castle Hills. I think it would be a, a, a profound opportunity for us in, in, the, in the nature of economic development. So I would move approval of the application submitted by Ryan Ramey for the proposed removal of the four oak trees 
for the construction of a new co commercial structure to be located as uh, identified in agenda item two here at the southeast corner of West Avenue and Northwest Loop 410. I second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Isbrand, a second by Mr. May. Do we have a discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you, council. Okay, on to item number three. Uh, conduct public hearing on an application from Kevin Love requesting a change of zoning from a single A family district to a double A single family district on a lot located at 101 Hibiscus, Castle Hills, Texas, legal description CB5778, Woods West of West, lot 1D. It is 655 and we will open the public hearing. Mr. Mayor, I have a presentation on behalf of the applicant. Okay. Mr. Zamaron, if you want to get that uploaded and then we'll do the public hearing right now so that we can get feedback from anybody that would like to speak and then uh, Mr. Lewis will have you come up on the next item. So I'm, I'm going to speak as a citizen first. Okay, if you want to speak during the public right. hearing as a citizen. Then I'll do the presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, basically, as a citizen, having gone through the Zoning Commission app, uh, pr protocol, I found some problems and I think that you as city council members are all in possession of the letter that I sent in. Have you had a chance to re read it and review it? Okay. Because somewhere along the way, uh, and, and understand this isn't a matter of winning or losing. I am uh, basically employed or a consultant for the stallion group to try to find the best use of the land at 101 Hibiscus. As a citizen, having gone through the uh, situation with the Zoning Commission, I have, through the years, have been doing this for 40 years, been before many uh, commissions, boards, city councils, and, and I've never quite seen what I saw in this particular situation. I mean, it started with, um, I don't know, whether city staff had not given the information to the zoning commission from the replat that we had looked at that had all sorts of information in it, like tree surveys and stormwater, uh, you know, uh, studies, um, all the things that some of the citizens and some of the commissioners during the proceedings with trying to determine whether they should give me a yay or nay, they didn't have or they didn't read, including the uh, appraisal that was done by Blair Stouffer. Um, they acted as if they'd never seen or heard about that either or possibly didn't read it. So my first situation is, is that we need to have full disclosure of information. Tonight, I asked city staff, and, and don't get me wrong, I think Lewis and Ryan are absolutely fantastic and I know that they're very, very busy but I asked to find out what city council had as far as information for the meeting tonight. And I never got an answer on that. So I don't even know what you guys have. I asked you, I know you have the letter and what have you, but I don't know if you have any of the platting information. Um, in, in, the, in the recommendations that were made, uh, zoning and the replatting process are totally two different animals. And somewhere along the way, zoning commission I think got kind of wrapped up in maybe needing to know the platting of this project. I'm gonna read you some of their quotes. You have them, but I'm gonna read them for the rest of everybody else because the bottom line is, is that this is a process. I like the process to be done in a, in a way that there would be no one who feels walking away that no one had any information on it. Uh, the third thing I have in my letter is that there's a disregard for the professionalness of uh, an appraiser by the name of Blair Stouffer. He heard the video and he's written you guys a letter. And I know that you've seen it. Um, I'm gonna read an excerpt of that when I give my presentation. And, and the, the final thing is, is I've never gone before a city council board, anybody ever, uh, to try to get something changed or have something done without questions. And there was a lot of, of concern as to what was going on, a lot of ambiguity, 
but not a single question was asked of me as the applicant. And I found that disturbing. And it also found it suspicious because it seemed like there was a predetermined outcome of the meeting to begin with. Not saying there was, but not being asked a question or having any discussion back and forth left me feeling like there was nothing uh, that was to be determined that night. But I'm gonna just say that there was a, one of the commissioners said, after he moved that the council recommend the application be denied. I know that there's information that we do not have access among others, the petition that's been submitted. None of us, I believe, have seen that yet. I haven't, I think there are issues to be considered before we act on it one way or the other. Then he voted to deny. Um, to go on, there's a number of issues and note that the problems with one of the appraiser, with the appraiser that Mr. Lewis cites did not appear when I was available for questioning. I don't even know if they read the appraisal, but I don't know, he could, they could have asked me any question. I understand that I'm not the appraiser, but I read the appraisal. I read the you know, document and I could have answered anything that was on there. There to go on, um, there were presentations by members of the public regarding the value of the property I regard to which they are qualified to testify. Uh, Mr. Martinez in particular indicates you have a $200,000 loss in property value based on the appraisal that Mr. Lewis offered and that's worth consideration. And he voted to deny. The last thing in fact, we don't have any diagrams of the sewer or any that would be required for the property to be platted this way and uh, Problems other than that, the application we have before us really purports to be kind of a plat application rather than just an application for changing zoning. I think that before the city makes a decision on how it would rule on the thing in the end, I think it that a plat should be proposed so that the city can look and see how the property is really going to be used. Based on that, in the moment, my recommendation would be that we form a recommendation to deny the application. These are quotes. And all I'm saying is that the things that I'm complaining about resulted in decisions being made without information. Finally, one of the uh, commissioners said, I had a problem looking at the drawing. One, I couldn't need, I couldn't read dimensions on the lot on this stuff, but it appeared to me that there's five lots, 200 feet frontage. Given an average of 40 feet apiece, that doesn't fit. And again, he voted to deny. And all this information and all these ambiguities were all available from city staff or from the applicant. So the whole process uh, I find to be, I don't wanna say unprofessional, but it was very, very disappointing as a citizen of this Castle Hills that we would have decisions being made of that magnitude with information being missing and overstepping boundaries of doing zoning or doing replanting. Thank you for your time. Do we have anybody? Well, there's nobody else signed up for the public hearing. Is there anybody else? Uh, okay. Um, you come on up. Um, whichever way you'd like. Miss Ackley, you can come first. Good evening, uh, council members. I'm Jacqueline Ackley from 118 West Castle Lane, which is a lane west of West Avenue. Uh, I was at the meeting that Mr. Lewis references. I still have their uh, minutes and the, all the attachments which were downloadable from the computer for that meeting. Um, I wanna make a handful of points. Uh, both my husband and I have sent to zoning commission and I believe have been forward to you all, two letters. Please tell me you've gotten our two letters. Um, we're in opposition to the five homes on this slightly over one acre lot 101 Hibiscus Lane for a variety of reasons. I will also mention up front that there is a signed petition by homeowners who are within that 200 feet, I believe, of the property. Uh, over 20% of them are also against uh, that development. And I hope you have that petition. If not, I do tell you it exists and it can be found, will be found if, if you need us to find it. Um, 
sort of along Mr. Lewis's lines, um, and I mentioned this at the Zoning Commission, the Zoning Commission's own note to applicants, a standard form, tells what things must be turned into Zoning Commission to be considered. Well, looking at what they had in the packet and looking at what they asked for, there were tremendous numbers of missing objects. Uh, I referenced specifically numbers four, five, and eight, which number four is the main one to me at this point, the means of ingress and egress to public streets and adjacent properties. In other words, where's the driveways? How do they get in and out of these five homes nestled on one acre? Um, visual screening that is somewhat mentioned in the sense that Mr. Lewis says that for historical reasons, and I'm glad of, the about four and a half foot tall wall which flanks this property along West Avenue and also part of it, most of it, on Hibiscus would remain, but that has its own side effects too, which I will mention, and um, also modifications of existing drainage characteristics, etc. None of this was in the packet given to zoning commission meeting. My point here is they were asking for a zoning change from zone A to double A. And it seems to me that's cart before the horse that you would change the zoning before you know exactly what's gonna go on that property. Because once you change the zoning, well that's done, then it's a mad rush to fit what could fit that zoning on that property. Changing from zone A to zone double A is a very huge and a huge step because zone A residential is very precious. And as um, Blakely Fernandez, the lawyer neighbor of ours, taught us that zoning exists for a reason and the existing zoning should be considered the status quo, the gold standard, if you will. And there need to be extenuating circumstances to look at changing zoning to something else. So what is there takes precedence in my mind from what she taught me. I'm not a lawyer, but she was working with us. So the um, properties on the, di on the, we did get a small diagram that showed five properties being cut into this one acre, 1.01 acre lot. I would remind council, um, some member may actually have been on the previous city council that had to address this, but at one time on the original 101 Hibiscus, which was about 4.5 acres before the four occupied, well, three occupied homes and a tennis court got carved out of it, leaving this 1.01 .01 acre. Um, there was a proposal to put a planned unit development there, a PUD, which would have had about 16 homes on it. And one of the reasons for denying that application was the high density. Well, if you have 16 homes on 4.5 acres, that's less dense than five homes on one acre, which would lead to a density of 22 homes on 4.5 acres mathematically. So I'm just saying this body has already rejected that density, which was at a lower density. And so to approve a, a somewhat higher density on a portion of it seems reversing this council's own judgment in the past. I'm concerned too that the um, lane that this is on, Hibiscus Lane, like most of the lanes in West of West Avenue, is only about 19 and a half to 20 feet wide. You can barely pass two sizable well, automobiles, I call big iron, past each other. They have to kind of even get off and wait and let the other one gentlemanly go by and then, okay, resume their journey. And if there's a pedestrian or a bicycler or a jogger from Antonian, they're gonna to have to get off in the weeds because there is no sidewalk there. The five homes on this 101 Hibiscus lot would have to likely have their driveways coming out to Hibiscus Lane. I can't imagine them wanting to go to West Avenue to have to back out because they're only gonna have about 20 foot long driveways because zone AA only has a 20 foot setback requirement. Well, if you've got five acres and about 250 feet of length, you've got a uh, driveway about every 50 feet, but that first lot, which is closest to West Avenue, is 49 feet on its facing of Hibiscus, and the driveway's got to be some width. So it will probably come within, as it exits onto Hibiscus, within 30 feet of that stop sign that's at the corner there, which is against another city ordinance we have. But more importantly than 
the law is the fact that functionally that would put anybody backing out onto hibiscus lane or any mother pushing a baby carriage or a kid driving his bicycle quickly out of the driveway into that narrow two lane street without sidewalks left barren to a car coming south on West Avenue at the speed they travel, making a quick right hand turn onto Hibiscus, there would be a distance of less than 30 feet for that driver to rectify his actions and swerve into the oncoming traffic or hit the car, hit the child on the bike, hit the mother with the baby carriage. It's a matter of morbidity and mortality. And are we going to approve this for all times going forward to take that risk over and over. I think we should not. This is also a lane which is one of the two exits out of the neighborhood west of West Avenue onto West Avenue. There's a third exit out on Northwest Military Highway if you go out South Winston. But all these lanes are narrow and there will be no, according to the drawing, there is no provision for off-street parking for a, a guest or the yard man when they come with the big truck and the trailer and all their gear or the cable man to park. So they're going to have to park in the street, obscuring one lane, because there's no off-street parking for any of the five homes that have to be serviced. And that will narrow a bottleneck area where residents are trying to come out or, as I've just described, people turning off of West Avenue will try to come in quickly. So now you could have service vehicles parked, reducing this to one lane, and you still got residents of the five proposed homes coming in out of their driveways, and then traffic sweeping in from West Avenue. I just think this is not well thought out, and I would hate to change the zoning with it so ill thought out. And I think there are risks to, to, to life and health here. Um, I think that's, the majority of my points, and I do appreciate your listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ackley. Uh, Mr. Ackley? Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. I think uh, Jackie has uh, elucidated what we feel are um, many of the safety issues involved with this, uh, including the traffic and the parking and I uh, just point out to you in the letters that we sent to you, we had the, uh, an indication of the, of, of the relevant municipal ordinances on this, which doesn't allow uh, off street parking. So you, you have to have a street wide enough to accommodate the parking uh, that's on there. So it'd be in, in violation of that for, like Jackie said, the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> service man or uh, anybody that's coming there, and plus, with the short driveways, you'd have to back it out. Um, I'd just like to del uh, delve a little bit on on uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, zoning issues on this. Is that basically this is uh, spot zoning we're talking about. It's a change of the of the zoning in that particular area in one particular location. And I think others have, uh, have made the point that the Zoning Commission is that you could do the same thing anywhere in Castle Hills, buy up three homes of, you know, roughly an acre and, and have it rezoned double A. And I don't think that's, that's appropriate for, for zoning. And we're particularly concerned about it living on uh, West Castle Lane because, you know, there is a domino effect on these things. If you, if you have the end of this street go go um, into zone double A, then what's gonna happen to West Castle Lane? What's gonna happen to Foxhall Lane? Uh, you, you can't do this, and, and as we'll point out in the rural residential district area, the narrowness of the streets are, both would give the character of the area, but they also preclude this type of dense uh, development that's, that's uh, proposed here. And I'll just conclude on, on that, as I think Jackie has raised most of the parking and safety issues that we've had. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bella. Good evening, my name is Peter Bella. I'm a resident at 110 Hibiscus, just across the street from the 101 uh, lot. And uh, 
I hope, Mr. Ropley, you will have had the opportunity to include the petition, the citizen's petition, uh, disapproving of the proposal to re, uh, rezone 101. Is that something that, that y'all have in your packet? I hope so. At any rate, what that represents is a uh, majority of the, of the property owners directly around, some of which are here today, um, were against the rezoning. And I believe that with the denial of the rezoning proposal through the Zoning Commission itself, given the collection of signatures against the proposal, I believe that requires, a, in fact, Mr. Schnall, a supermajority of this body to overturn that Zoning Commission's uh, denial? Is that, at any rate, again, once again, uh, less than that legality in question, the idea of the proposed, the, the uh, petition signed by the citizens in denial of this request would seem to me to, un to underscore the concept that uh, it is not something that we, we want to see in our area. During the, one of the several public hearings we had, I believe it was Commissioner Bueller who mentioned that even though there might be consideration of the PUD that is farther down West Avenue between Hibiscus and Fox Hall lanes on the west side of West Avenue, that it was not a similar setting in the sense that the, the uh, West Oaks, I believe is the name of that development, Oaks of West Avenue, I'm not sure what the name is, uh, that property development had an ingress and an egress, a circular ingress and egress. And even if you look at the heading, the, the first, the northernmost, I guess you could say, ingress, it's basically a split, a split entryway. That is, there, there's a lane separation for vehicles going north on West Avenue and for vehicles going south. So that, that was not, it was not an apt comparison to think in terms of that PUD and what would be developed on Hibiscus, which is, just as Ms. Ackley said, a very narrow lane. So with those that's, thoughts in mind, um, I would continue to hold my position of not being in favor of this uh, rezoning proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bella. And do we have anybody else that'd like to speak? Okay. Uh, yes. Mr. Mayor. City Council, Abel Martinez at 105 Hibiscus. Thank you all for listening to us today. Um, if I ramble on, I apologize. I've been working on trying to get vaccines for our communities for the last couple of weeks. So I'm just a little tired, but I, I, and I really had no plans in coming down here today until I was on Zoom and I, and I heard David Lewis mention my name. And, and so I thought it'd be appropriate for me to come down here and, and kind of give you my thoughts. Uh, I'll start with this, 5-0. The Zoning Commission unanimously ruled against this project. Why? Because when David Lewis presented, even when he hired his um, appraiser, I was the one that spoke up and said, look, I am right next to this property. I am one, along with the Colleen's, probably going to be the most impacted by this subdivision within a subdivision. And I said, I can't let that happen. I'm not going to allow David Lewis, even though I know him well, he built my home um, to come in and now, and I'll ask David Lewis and I'll put him on the spot just as he put me on the spot earlier. Did you not, David Lewis, tell me that my property would appraise for over a million dollars? And absolutely. And now when he hires his appraiser to come in with this new plat, all of a sudden, and I got my appraisal and I'll be happy to bring it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll rush down here I don't have it with me, but I'll be happy to submit it. Right after my property was built, it did appraise. And he was correct. And I remember talking to David about this. And he was ecstatic that he was absolutely correct about the value and the appraisal of the property. But now after he submits a, a plat and a proposal to subdivide the property, his hired gun comes in and says that my property is now worth $200,000 less than David Lewis, although he's not an appraiser. You know, he's got a lot of experience, had valued it. And the initial appraisal right after the property was built came back. And so when I look at the appraisal, and I haven't looked at his letter from his, his appraisal, the new one he submitted, obviously he knew there was issues if he's submitting another letter 
again to the city council, but um, he even in, in his initial report to the zoning commission came in and said, I'm not considering traffic density. I'm not considering water flow um, and drainage. That in and of itself, David Lewis didn't even present that at the zoning commission. Two things that are extremely important in deciding what do you do with this property? Um, and, and, the, and the owners of this property, they, you know, they basically have said, what are we gonna do with it? They could outright sell it. They've had cash offers for this property, not at the amount that they want, but they've gotten cash offers. So it, it could easily be sold and, and rebuilt uh, as a home, um, but they've decided not to do that because it's a matter of dollars for them, which you know, I understand, but it's not a valid reason to go in and build a subdivision within a subdivision simply to try to make profit when you submit prop, you know, plans that really don't address the big issues. And, and what the zoning commission looked at and rightfully so was in protecting the health and safety of the community, which is their responsibility, he didn't provide anything to establish. And in fact, the neighbors did show that it's not gonna promote health and safety. In fact, it'll be dangerous because of the property. That intersection is really busy. And if you put five homes in that intersection, it's gonna be extremely busy. The, the street is so narrow that you can't really have cars coming out of that corner and then cars driving in. So you're talking about you know, the, the safety of the folks there. And I think there was one point where one of the neighbors brought in, uh, and David Lewis referred to this, was um, traffic lights and headlights and I was flat out honest with the commission. I said, the only lights I'm worried about are the ones that are gonna end up in my yard because it's an accident. And so what the, what the zoning commission did and rightfully so, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little appalled that David Lewis would come in and attack the, the city manager and the staff who worked really hard on this. And I applaud them and they weren't in our favor. They made us go through a lot of hoops and they did their due diligence. Uh, and I'm not gonna attack them because they did their job and they did it rightfully so, and, and they did a great job looking at the issues, presenting the issues to the zoning commission, and the zoning commission really focused on what is the best for this neighborhood, and what's the best for the community, and what's gonna promote the health and safety of this area, and they rightfully decided that they needed to deny the request because it's not gonna promote the health and safety of the neighborhood, and when I asked the, uh, city council today to do the same thing, promote the health and safety of the neighborhood and pro promote the health and safety of the community. And I'll end just the same way I finished. It was 5-0. It was clear that this was not a project that the zoning commission wanted to look at and consider because the evidence before them was very, very clear that this was not in the best interest of the community. It was not in the best interest of the neighborhood. It was not in the best interest of those people that are walking in the area with narrow streets, streets, no sidewalks. And when they looked at Antonian and the kids that run through there, they said, this is not going to promote the health and safety of the city, the neighbors, the school, or anybody in this neighborhood. So again, I'll leave it as I started. It was clear to the zoning commission and they voted 5-0 to deny. And, and I request the city council to do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> My name is Renee Colleen. I am the owners of both uh, 103 Hibiscus Lane and the adjacent 6815 West Avenue. As always, I go after Mr. Martinez and he says things much better than I could ever say. But I will say that I do have, along with my neighbors, the same issues, especially with density. I'm a parent to five children, one of which has been just driving for the last three months. And one of, one of that, that, that hibiscus area is very, very tough for a driver that's been driving for a long time. And I worry for my daughter and for, this, and for my, my other kids that are going to start driving here before long. It's just too dense. It's a, it's a, treacherous, it's a treacherous intersection. And it just scares my wife and I to death. Uh, beyond that, sometimes ditto is the best thing to say. And I will say, thank you folks. Thank you, sir. 
And if we don't have anybody else, we will move on to the next section. Uh, closing the public hearing at 724. Uh, moving on to item number four, discussion of possible action on recommendation from the Zoning Commission on an application from Kevin Love requesting a change of zoning from a single family district to a double A single family district on a lot located at 101 Hibiscus, Castle Hills, Texas. Legal description CB5778, Woods West of West, lot 1D. Okay, Mr. Lewis, uh, your presentation is up. Thank you. So, well, one of the things in, in researching and, and having been involved in so many of these, um, usually there has to be a reason for rezoning. Um, you know, and, and from A to double A, that's basically creating a situation to where you can go from as little as 14,000 square feet of, of, of yard to 7,500 square feet of yard. And I, as I recall, one third of an acre, and then double A is 7,500. There's already one house there. There's four houses that's gonna be facing the street. And things have changed. The demographics of the area have changed. There are people like the Martinez's and others that are coming in with kids. The old regime, my parents, Peter's parents, uh, and me, <laughs> old regime, um, a lot of us are rethinking where we're gonna live and a lot are trying to downsize. And some people are actually trying to get into garden homes in Castle Hills. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Mr. Gregory, when I was in your living room with Mr. Garvin, who, when we were talking to you about, you know, subdividing, you asked me, have I ever thought about doing garden homes? And I'm like, you know, you planted a seed. And I'm thinking, you know, really, I looked up on the internet and I looked up MLS and the need for garden homes in this area. One goes on the market and it sells in 60 days. The need is strong. You've got high, you have West Avenue. West Avenue is the only place that has sewer and some land. And there aren't very many places you could put garden homes in Castle Hills, period. So with the traffic count on West Avenue, and I remember the day that West Avenue turned from one lane to two lanes, how mad my father was, because it was going to take the sleepy little town of Castle Hills and turn us into a highway in front. And he just hated the idea. And yeah, it's a horrible intersection. The safety of that intersection, though, is going to have to be fixed another way. You can't just deny adding any more people because they're doing that right now. One of them is going to have four new drivers, as he said himself, coming up. There's gonna be more cars on Hibiscus. That situation is not going away unless we start looking at a solution rather than trying to deny anything else going on. We look at a solution like a traffic light or something else to solve it. One of the things I did think of is that if this was allowed, we could request and put into the plat sidewalks. There should be sidewalks there, that'd be great. Have sidewalks going from, because it's already one on West Avenue, so you just continue down Hibiscus and you put a sidewalk take the fence out like you had in some of your rural district ideas where you're gonna take a line from 45 feet, 45 feet, cut across and not have obstructions because that really is the most serious thing on that intersection. But whether we put four more houses in or if I just go down to three houses, which is uh, my code, we could just replat that. That ain't gonna stop or solve or create any more problem with this intersection. This intersection is a problem and no one's doing anything but say, we don't want to build anymore. But um, the other thing is that Mr. Martinez, everybody here, the quotes that I gave you from the zoning commission all say that they didn't have the information. I don't know, Mr. Ryan, if you're still there, I mean, Ryan, do you have a replat application that shows stormwater studies, tree surveys, and all the things that they're asking for, a full plat showing you exactly what the lot's gonna look like, we have that. I don't know where it went, but I'm really a little bit tired of being told I didn't present the information that I needed to present to everybody to make this decision because I did. And so that's one of my reasons why I'm angry and complain earlier is because one of the reasons why it's being denied, if you look back and read the notes, I transcribed the uh, notes. 
And the decisions that were being made were, I don't have enough information. We don't have enough information to even make a decision, yet they made a decision. And two of them said that. So yeah, there's a problem. There's a problem on West Avenue. There's a problem with 101 hibiscus because something's gonna have to happen to it. And someday on spot zoning, and just to give you an idea, because I'm also kind of tired about hearing about spot zoning. The problem is, is that to have spot zoning, to put garden homes somewhere, you have to have sewer, period, you have to. I have, I'll show you the slide in a second. I mapped the sewers out. And the only sewer that you could ever do it with is on West Avenue. So you can't go down Miller, you know, Foxhall, buy three lots and have garden homes. You can't do it. But everybody keeps saying spot zoning, spot zoning, this is spot zoning. Well, across the street was a commercial establishment. And the definition of spot zoning is off the internet and from people who are involved in zoning, the process of singling out a small parcel of land for a use classification totally different from that of the surrounding area. A to AA is not totally different. It's residential, there's commercial across the street. And if you go down Hibiscus, I mean, West Avenue, you will find, and you can go ahead and go to my next slide if you would, um, you'll find there's other subdivisions already. I marked that for you, you may not be able to see it. It doesn't come up, does it come up on your screen? Okay. So if you're going down and there's the white, that's the, I put it upside down, I apologize. That's the location of the lot we're looking at. And then right across the street, you have a tremendous amount of commercial. Down the street towards military, you have a small community on Daney Lane, a church or school right behind it. Then you got West Oaks, and then you've got the other subdivision, the small lots right off of that. This is not spot zoning. Spot zoning also, and this is the reason why not having a master plan causes so much grief with anybody who wants to develop anything and citizens who don't want anything developed. Perhaps the most important criteria of determining spot zoning is the extent to which the disputed zoning is consistent with the municipality's comprehensive plan. Well, what do you say? What are you gonna do with West Avenue? I'm just curious. It's got sewer, it has a traffic count that is a state highway, and yet we're taking these little areas and we're saying no to this one, yes to this one, no to this one, yes to this one. We have a need for garden homes. We have no place to put them. This is a perfect infield opportunity to do that. And no one wants to do it. And I'm just gonna say that as far as the driveways are concerned, I built in Alma Heights, they have the same problem. I could restrict garages to the very back of the lot, which I was gonna do anyway, because who wants to see 20 feet of a house which garage, no one wants to. So you put the garages in the back and you end up with a hundred linear feet of driveway. Lots of parking spots. And I hate to say, as I drive down Hibiscus right now with the two, three new homes, there's off street parking every night. And you know, there's park on the city easement and people still can get by the little 19 foot wide lane of which they want for the rural district, but they don't want in case someone wants to do any developing then it's charming. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit off, but um, the spot zoning compatibility, the things that the zoning commission turned it down for are clear. I gave you the quotes, I didn't make those quotes up, those are the quotes. And as far as the valuations, I wouldn't have brought this up, but since it was brought up again, which I wish it hadn't been, I wanna read you the letter that, um, you have in your, your book. To Ryan, uh, I never pronounced this right. Rappelgate, help me out on that one. Mr. Lewis, Mr. David Lewis provided me with a transcript via YouTube of the meeting regarding the rezoning of 101 Hibiscus. I was alarmed by the comments made by Mr. Martinez, which I find to be slanderous, relating to me personally. I am due a retraction for the comments that he quoted at the meeting concerning the report I submitted to Mr. Lewis, as no discussion or mention of any exact property value was noted. My report is attached here too, and clearly reflects there are no comments relating to specific value was noted or ever noted by my report. 
My scope of work was clearly to determine only the highest and best use of the subject land parcel and to form an opinion as to if the development into townhomes would adversely affect property values in the area. It is alarming that one reputation can be tainted and slandered in the manner in which this happened and the Castle Hills board should be well aware that his comments were erroneous and inaccurate as to the claims he made against me. I am in no way disclosed any value in my cons consultation letter or ever appraised this residence. It would be a clear violation of ethics to close his or anyone's market value without permission to do so. Thus his comments re relating to the same are slanderous and untrue. And again, a retraction of the accusation needs to be forthcoming to your board and to me personally. I am totally unaware of where he got his figures from as it was not me or from my report. My reputation speaks for itself. I stand behind my findings that no detriment to property values in this area would result from an attractive townhomes project like Mr. Lewis would build. I get to these meetings, zoning meetings, uh, board meetings, all these meetings, and all this information comes up. Things that are slanted, not true, and I don't mean that anybody was trying to slander anybody, but I can tell you right now that Mr. Stouffer's a little bit peeved when he looked at the zoning videos and watched it. It really upset him because he's one of the most respected appraisers there is in this city, period, bar none. Anyway, all I'm saying is that no one's going to want progress. No one wants anything to be done with West Avenue. I guess no one's going to want garden homes anywhere because there's no place to put it. If you go to the next slide for me. If you look at that slide, you're gonna see in blue, the only properties that I know of in Castle Hills, there's some on South Winston that would take bringing sewer down to it. But those that you see in blue are the only ones that have any possibility of sewer in any kind of smaller density. And understand this high density you're talking about is 80% of Alamo Heights. And I know no one moved here to live in Alamo Heights, but this is the first lot off of West Avenue. And as you walk down the street from there, it's <clears> going to affect the canopy of trees. It's not going to affect the ambience of walking down Fox Hall. It's not going to get people in Antonian because they run down Fox Hall and up Winston. All these things that we're worried about, this isn't going to cause those to happen. So I just want you to think about the city, think about your master plan, and I really appreciate, if nothing else tonight, that you postpone your decision and look into what happened to the Zoning Commission, because what happened there was bad information, overstepping zoning protocols, and going into the technical aspects of a plat, which is not what's supposed to be happening at that zoning meeting. I appreciate you listening to me and I hope you'll at least postpone and find out what happened. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Rapley. Uh, Mr. Rapley, you need to take your mute off. All right, Mayor. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, for Mr. Lewis's benefit, I did provide um, all the correspondence that he had requested that I provide the city council. Hard copies on those. Um, you know, in this matter, um, I can't speak for the entire commission, but as staff um, provided the application backup for their review on a zoning request change through chapter 50. I think if it would have been a replat process, leave under chapter 40, and Mr. Zamorano, correct me or not, that all of those applicable items or requirements would need to be submitted and would have gone to city council, not the zoning commission. I believe in this case, the applicant had a choice of either replatting or going to 
again, this was a, a, a simple zoning request. To the zoning I'll elaborate on that as well. Okay, you so see, uh, we have a uh, Mr. Solis, correct? Yes, sir. I am here. Can you hear me? But it's it's the number one phrase I heard of of 2020 was, "Can you hear me?" Since everybody's doing these kind of meetings, um, Mayor and Council, you know, I've always enjoyed the opportunity to serve, and one of the things that that I've enjoyed most was the ability uh, to be able to at once or twice you know, do a quote that I enjoy. Hold on, let me get my video going to match so you can see me. But this is this is my favorite quote that I finally get to use. It's like, Mr. Lewis, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. The question that he brought up just does not jive. Your zoning commission took this seriously. We had three public hearings, three mayor on this one issue. We had community people come forward. Mr. Lewis, every single time, made a presentation. The, the, the little tit for tat about what a public hearing was about and what a citizen said versus somebody else has no room for us to be considering. And quite honestly, it just goes with the public hearing, as we heard today. The stretching of what took place in our zoning commission uh, meetings, um, you know, I've heard some good stretching of, of, of facts, uh, but today was was truly a stretch that was was comparable to something you'd see in Washington, D.C. today. But what I'd like to be able to say, Mayor and Council, our recommendation was solid. Our reviews were, were thorough and comprehensive. Even Mr. Lewis, who, who admitted to saying, as I heard correctly, uh, that everything that was required for him to be submitted for our review was turned in. There's your answer right there. We reviewed everything that was required. And he admitted he gave us everything that we needed to make a decision. It was a zoning commission. And it was a zoning request that was before us. Nothing about platting, nothing about anything else. Just a simple zoning case. Your zoning commission... It's not like the ones of the past, quite honestly, and I'll be forgiven for those of you that have served on that. But I think Mr. <clears throat> Lewis was stuck in the time where he was used to lobbying individually commissioners. That didn't happen here. He's used to being able to maybe cajole people. That didn't happen here. We had public hearings because I wanted transparency. There doesn't need to be no behind the scenes meeting with a developer to try to figure things out. Come to the zoning commission make your presentations. I appreciated all the citizens bringing forth their concerns because that's what this is about. Continuity of communities that make up our beautiful city of Castle Hills. Mayor, the recommendation is solid. It was thorough and I have no problems putting my stamp on it as chair of the zoning commission so we can move forward with it. My recommendation to the council uh, and to you, Mr. Mayor, is that you approve this and let's move forward. Thank you, Mr. Solis. That being said, uh, I'll entertain a motion, Council. Or I'm sorry, let me take a step back. Do we have anybody else that want to speak on this before we take a vote? Mr. Bella? I just wanted to make sure I understood. Uh, hi, Mr. Solis. Uh, that it was an approval to deny, or in other words, I'm not sure. His suggestion. I'm not Mr. The recommendation before um, the city council is denial, sir. Okay, just to clarify. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Isbrand. Um, Mayor, I'd, uh, I'd move that we accept the recommendation of the Zoning Commission and deny the request for a change of zoning from a single family district to double A single family district for the lot as described in agenda item four. I second. We have a motion by Mr. Brown and a second by Mr. Discussion. May. Discussion, Mr. Gregory. I'd like to ask Mr. Snall a question. A member of the commission has a property right next to this property and he voted it up or down. First, is that a conflict of interest? And two, if it is a conflict of interest, does the 5-0 unanimous vote make a difference? Um, Mr. Gregory, who is the member of the commission you're referring to who has a property next door or nearby? Mr. Martinez. 
No, Mr. Lewis made the comment that Mr. Martinez voted against it. I think Mr. Lewis misspoke. I think he meant that Mr. Martinez spoke against it. Mr. Martinez is not a member of the Zoning Commission. Oh. Um, the members of the Zoning Commission, I'm doing this from memory, Mr. Solis, please forgive me. Our Mr. Solis is chair, Mr. Herndon, um, Jackson. Mr. McCormick, Mr. Uh, Bueller, and um, Mr. Charles Jackson. And those are the five members of the Zoning Commission who heard um, each of the presentations and was present during, I believe all of them were present or on video on, on Zoom for each of the three meetings Mr. Solis referred to. Uh, if a member of the Zoning Commission did live next door to the property or was one of the people who received the notice uh, of the hearing as a citizen under our ordinance, um, it would be my recommendation that person um, sign an affidavit of recusal in advance and not participate in the Zoning Commission meeting. Um, I had to do that once as chairman of the Zoning Commission um, years and years ago. Um, and it's my consistent advice to anyone who's in that situation. And Councilman, I, I apologize, but I would have caught that myself as chair. If anybody has a, po a potential conflict of interest, we would have addressed it at the start. So it would not, before, it would not come before you without that due diligence between Mark, myself, uh, it's our jobs to make sure that there are no conflicts of interest with the recommendation that comes before you, sir. Mr. Gregor, any further questions? Any other questions, Council? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Paul. Yes, I'd like to say a couple of things. Number one, <clears throat> I will remember that 16 houses trying to go into that space. I believe it was five to zip against them going in and Mr. Gregory and I were both on council at that time and voted accordingly. I'm a little dismayed and a little frustrated that unfortunately Mr. Lewis seems to forget some basic stuff there. Like Mr. Solis said, I listened to all three of the meetings at the different times because I wanna learn what's going on, especially since I'm in and out of the city on a temporary basis. Uh, I believe it would be spot zoning if we did that. I realize that across the street there's other properties, but it's across a four lane highway. And to me, that's not the same neighborhood. This piece of property, I agree with everything that the people have already said about the additional traffic. It doesn't fit the neighborhood like the 16 does not fit the neighborhood. And as far as Mr. Martinez, and his discussion about taxes or worth or values. Mr. Martinez is a citizen and a neighbor and he has a right to express his opinion. He does not represent the city. So I don't really know why that's such a big issue that we have to draw lines to, but that's just my opinion on this. Um, I had, could have more to say, but I think that would be enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, Mr. Joyce, did you have a comment? I just had a quick question for Mr. Lewis. Sir, why did your client elect, you mentioned the idea of the possibility of three homes. Why did your client elect to change zoning and go for five instead of just building three homes, which would have been allowed under the current zoning? You know, the, the whole purpose would be to be able to move somebody in at a $500,000 price range and to cut the street and bring sewer and do all the utilities for three lots is cost prohibitive. With five lots, it makes sense. So well, that would be the, I'm not saying they won't go back and do three, but uh, at this point, uh, they're kind of in a quandary as to what to do. And again, you know, I, I, I'm their representative. Uh, it was never Lewis subdivision. And uh, so I gave my best effort tonight. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm still, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, watch the zoning. I watched and wrote every word down. My problem was, is that it even was said by one of the commissioners that this looks more like an application for a um, plant than it does for zoning. Not to say they didn't make the right decision in the end, to say that the process of getting there 
I, I really didn't feel comfortable with what people were saying and what knowledge they didn't have. It bothered me. So that's why I bring that up to you. Thank you. Mr. Joyce, any further questions? Mr. Joyce, any further questions? Okay. Um, I just like to thank uh, Commissioner Solis and all the commissioners on the zoning commission for uh, really belaboring the point and making sure that they're getting all the community input because I'd like to say that uh, transparency is important now, more important than ever. And I applaud y'all for going the extra mile to hear and give everybody an opportunity to be heard. If there's no further questions, we will proceed with the vote. All in favor of accepting the Zoning Commission's uh, rejection? The referral? Yes, sir. Uh, unanimous. Thank you, Council. Okay, item number five, conduct a public hearing on application on the request for a special use permit from YDEM LLC at the property at 2101 Northwest Military Highway and legally described as lot 70 block nine, Castle Hills, city block 208, Castle Hills Bank subdivision in the city of Castle Hills, Bear County, Texas, according to plat recorded in volumes 9503, page 137 of the deed and plat records of Bear County, Texas. The SUP request is to allow Verdict Coffee, a mobile food vendor, to operate a mobile coffee truck trailer on said property. Uh, Mr. Rapley, you had a comment? Yes, Mayor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I received an email today from the applicant, Mark White, and I'll just read it verbatim. He says, uh, looks like we are going to pass on our agenda item tonight related to the coffee truck, so it can be dropped from the agenda at this time. We will circle back. So it looks like they're not going to pursue this at that time. Okay. Council wants to refer <clears throat> on Mr. Schnall on continuing with the public hearing if people are here to speak about it. Um, but then uh, council can uh, discuss or take action if they want, I believe. Pass on it. Table. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schnall, do you have any direction on how to proceed? Um, if I think you should open the public hearing, see if anyone has taken the time to either be there in person or to comment um, uh, remotely. Um, and then after the public hearing is over, close the public hearing. Um, and then when you get to um, item six on possible action, it seems to me there's just no action to take. Um, the applicant does not ask for a table, but the applicant simply said, pass it. So I think the applicant assumes rightly or wrongly, that um, it can be brought back later. Um, we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. But at this point, I think first and foremost, if anyone has taken the time to come or be on the, on the Zoom to make a comment, we should make sure we open the public hearing and allow anyone to speak um, and then close the public hearing. And on item six, uh, it seems to me that in light of the applicant's position, no action needs to be taken. Thank you, Mr. Schnall. It is 7.53 and we're gonna open the public hearing. Let me check online if we have anybody. Okay, with that being said, we will close the public hearing at 7.53 and move on to item number six. Uh, discussion and possible action on a recommendation from the Zoning Commission on an application on requesting for a special use permit for YDEM LLC at the property located at 2101 Northwest Military Highway and legally described as Lot 70 Block 9, Castle Hills City Block 208, Castle Hills Bank Subdivision in the City of Castle Hills, Bear County, Texas, according to a plat recorded in not, Volume 9503, page 137 of the deed and plat records of Bear County, Texas. The SUP request is to allow Verdict Coffee, a mobile food vendor, to operate a mobile food truck trailer on said property. Do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor, would you like me to comment on that or you? you... Mr. Snow? Um, I believe Mr. Solis has asked if the council would like to hear his report from the Zoning Commission. Council, do we have anybody that would like to hear it? Okay, uh, Mr. Joyce would love to hear it. 
<laughs> a real simple thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I appreciate it. Uh, we, we again reviewed this one. It seemed like the applicant had a little bit more due diligence to be able to, to get along a little bit more uh, with the neighborhood and the neighbors that are surrounded it immediately. As you recall, back in the day, you approved uh, the uh, the attorneys and the loss, and, and they have had been great neighbors in that role. But the changing of what they were proposing uh, brought up some different issues that, that weren't there before. And uh, quite honestly, the, the, the zoning commission felt that they had not done the due diligence to be able to justify this change. The, the neighbors were, of course, not happy. Uh, because it goes to what we have always talked about zoning is about continuity and the preservation of what is there today uh, without disruption. So therefore, uh, once again, the Zoning Commission was very um, decisive in denial of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solis. If there's no questions for Mr. Solis, we will proceed to item number seven with no action on item number six. Item number seven, conduct a public hearing on amendments to the zoning ordinance to create a RR rural residential zoning district to include the use building area, height area, construction material, fencing, vehicle parking and storage and other regulations for a RR rural residential district. It is 756 and we're gonna open the public hearing. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Lewis signed up. You guys probably get tired of hearing from me. Um, last time I, at the zoning meeting, said anything about the idea of a rural district, um, I had taken all 120 properties that are west of west. And what they had is some preliminary numbers of setbacks and square footages and size of lots and what have you. When someone said earlier that it's like putting the cart before the horse when you um, want to try to get a zoning change and yet they want to know how long the driveway is and how big the house and what it's going to look like before you get the zoning change. When I suggested anything about some of the ideas that they were coming up with as far as restrictions, um, they tried, you know, one time they tried to cut me off and thank you for the city attorney saying that I had the right to be able to ask these questions. But I was involved in the residential guidelines with um, Alamo Heights. When they were running across a similar thing in the cottage area and they're having a hard time trying to figure out how high, how many square feet and things like that. Um, really need to know, I mean, first off, whether we need to have a rural district or not is and to my mind, kind of questionable. And the one thing I would like to know for sure is that even though you grandfather, so you don't have an acre, or you, you, you don't have, you're within 10 feet of your neighbor's house or whatever you're gonna have as far as setbacks. Almost every time that I've dealt with this, you have to go before a variance committee. And now all of a sudden, when you're trying to add your casita or whatever you're adding, you have to go before the Board of Adjustments, which takes a super majority to be able to pass. And I've gone before lots of Board of Adjustments. And what has happened to me in the past is that it's turned into more like an architectural review. Citizens will come and say, well, I don't want a window there because I might be able to see you. Well, I don't want the, I want this tree here saved, I want you to move your house. And so all of these people in the original proposal 82% of the lots, 120 lots, were in violation of one or the other of some of the things being presented, including the size of the lot. Now, you may have changed that, but whatever ends up being the final, it needs to be something that not everybody is going to have to come before the Board of Adjustments and deal with that every time they want to add something to their house. And grandfathering doesn't work because right now, if you're in violation and you want to do something, unless you can do an ordinance like that, saying that from this day forward, you don't have to get a variance. And that's the only thing that I really have as a problem with it. Um, I would give my two cents worth because I probably have as much experience in this particular item as anybody could possibly have because I've done it before. 
And, uh, you know, anybody who wishes to ask, I'm here for your help. And it's not that I'm against it. It's just that I don't want it to be something that comes laborious to you guys because you will have to have 2,000 ARB meetings, you know, in a year's time or something. Anyway, that's, that's what I have. And if you want my stats, I have a spreadsheet. The original stats that they had with setbacks, lot sizes, the height of the house uh, really needs to be more of a, um, well, I'll go into that detail later. But if you'd like to have any of this information, I'll send it to you because I spent probably two days putting it together when you very first brought up the ideas of doing this. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up we have Mr. Rackley. Thank you, Mayor and, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here today to represent the, uh, the group of citizens that uh, first proposed the uh, rural residential district to the Zoning Commission. And I'd like to show you the presentation that uh, Quentin Baker delivered at Zoning Commission. He's uh, out of town this week on business. So uh, uh, he's uh, appointed me in his stead to, to do that, so. So this was the uh, citizens group presentation. Uh, you put on slideshow, I think. You come up on slideshow, I think. Just uh, can you click on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this was, as I mentioned, was first presented at the public hearing, and uh, now at the city council meeting. Next slide, please. The presentation participants at that time, uh, including several that are here tonight, are, are listed here. Quentin Baker, uh, myself, Peter Bell, uh, Jackie, uh, Terry Worth, Ava Martinez, and uh, Wayne Carter. Next. Uh, <clears throat> we had discussed the aesthetics of this proposed uh, rural residential area at the first public hearing. I think everybody's familiar with them. It's a very country-like uh, rural uh, atmosphere, the narrow lanes, the very uh, dense tree cover, the wildlife, uh, and basically a great place uh, to live. And, and actually for people other than our, the residents to, uh, to recreate, we see many walkers from other areas of uh, Castle Hills that come over into this area. Next. The heritage is that the area was developed before city, uh, Castle Hills became a city. It's a rural area. It would have fox hunting lodges and narrow lanes, water wells, septic systems characterize the area. And this area does retain its rural roots. Next. The three fundamental issues for the pro proposed rural district. Uh, we already heard about the narrow lanes and the life safety issues, lack of stormwater infrastructure which is a life safety issue and property damage, no sanitary sewer in infrastructure, and county regs effectively require greater than 0.6 acre lot size to account for setbacks, uh, easements, and so forth, and to put in an a, a local uh, septic system. Next. So the narrow lanes are uh, 20 feet wide, no shoulder sidewalks or curbs, insufficient room for on-street parking and forces vehicles to park partially or completely in front yards, and parked cars can choke uh, vehicle movement. Current of very low traffic density and provides safe recreational walking and running, as uh, was mentioned for the cross-country teams of uh, a couple of schools, actually. Uh, the Christian School uh, has been seen out there, as well as Antonian. <clears throat> and we can't tolerate increased uh, residential density, which would uh, create greater pedestrian hazard, increased deterioration of road service, and cost the city increased maintenance and repair costs. So next, the stormwater infrastructure, uh, the, there's no stormwater drains, sewers, or culverts, 
large lots with a relatively low, uh, low impervious cover uh, can mitigate the stormwater runoff. And flooding already occurs in this district and downstream from Antonia and South, and the, uh, this is the Yompos Creek area, and the infrastructure cannot handle increases in inflow. And in this case, the streets are flooding uh, when the Castle Hills First Baptist uh, Church expanded a parking lot in their gym. This would incre greatly increase the uh, flow of water down uh, through the uh, drainage easement that runs beside my property and down through the Baker's previous home and, and out, uh, out on Hibiscus Lane. And uh, <clears throat> this is an increased density such as the 101 Hibiscus PUD, which uh, had, had in their plan a, 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 uh, a detention pond in order to mitigate uh, the flooding. However, we pointed out at that time that still that uh, increased uh, uh, drainage from that would uh, cause a greater than six inch uh, water depth on the roads uh, because there's no stormwater uh, drains to take it off, which is a traffic hazard by, uh, by Muni code. A denser housing requires the city to bear the high cost to, uh, to uh, add stormwater infrastructure if they, if they uh, possibly wanted to develop this area. Next. <clears throat> These are average lot sizes and uh, far from Mr. Lewis. We've done our own study too, but on the uh, lanes that were talked about, we're talking about uh, average lot sizes running, as you can see on the table, from uh, 0.737 and, uh, up to over two uh, lots. Uh, two acres and include the large acre on uh, 213 and 0.9 acres uh, before, before lo below there. Next. <clears throat> increased density would be uh, responsibility of the city, increased expenses for wider streets, road maintenance, stormwater infrastructure, and sanitary sewer. Okay, next. In the 1997 comprehensive plan that addressed, uh, that now addresses the proposed road district has recommended that replatting of multi-acre lots be restricted, resulting in lot size in no less than one acre, no rezoning to multi-family. Uh, and the Southwest zone is floodplain to the railroad tracks and should be left in its natural state. And this zone is west, uh, the west sides of McGimsey, 213 Hibiscus and Fox Hall Cove. So, we can't increase uh, uh, density of housing there without uh, adversely affecting the stormwater downstream. Also, they, under that, and then natural resources, they said preservation of natural sources should be a, is a priority in city planning. And I think everyone would agree that this is the, the uh, highest natural, uh, natural resource area in, uh, in Castle Hills. And the city of Castle Hills is to work with neighborhood groups to develop ordinances which improve and maintain environmental standards for neighborhoods and open spaces. So I think basically this is, this is what we're asking. Next. Now, <clears throat> attempted development efforts in the residential use have been detrimental to the area and city, both in the uh, many fights that we've had uh, over things like the rezoning of the uh, uh, the special use permits for the Castle Hills First Baptist Church, which dragged on for almost six years, ended up in federal court, and then a, a traffic settlement that finally ended up in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, maintenance of, uh, of that and denial of their parking lot. And uh, more recently on the basis charter school on, uh, on South Winston, that same location, there was a memory care facility on Castle Hills First Baptist Church it was proposed and then uh, Danny Lane were there and on that same piece on the, right across the street from our house on West Castle Lane, they wanted to put a PUD with six townhouses on that. We went through a great amount of research uh, to uh, do this with uh, including uh, uh, payment by the neighbors of legal fees, of uh, traffic engineering studies, of civil engineering studies, and uh, much, uh, many countless hours testifying before zoning commissions, city council and so forth uh, over the past 20 years. And we, we just continue these fights as we see even to the present day. So these are, are many, uh, there's no been, as we said at that time, there's been no lot, a shortage of bad ideas of what to do with uh, this property. 
And it's all about money. You know, it's just cheap residential land, and relatively cheap. Uh, and uh, we feel that the re residential district will put, you know, it would, it would allow the neighbors to say, look, we're in a residential district, a rural residential district, and you shouldn't have these uses here. And the zoning commission has listened to us on this. Next. So one might say, well, what have you done with all that uh, development? And the idea is that we, any of the houses on, on there over the past 20 years have been uh, completely rebuilt or renovated. And you can see the percentages here that really 37% of the houses that have, uh, uh, were on uh, West Council uh, on those uh, four streets have been, uh, have been uh, renovated or rebuilt. Uh, and their property value, as I studied a couple of years ago, has basically uh, brought the area's uh, median house value up to about twice what the median house value is in Castle Hills in general. So this contributes to the tax base of uh, Castle Hills, and, and they're doing it because it's a very, very uh, uh, nice place to live. As Mr. Martinez has recently moved into this area, and that's one of the selling points that that we have is that there, there aren't very many people in, inside you know, where you can have large lots and a, a country-like way of life. Um, and currently there's undeveloped lots. There's about a total of 14. Four of those, are, as we speak, are undergoing renovation at this particular time. That's really gonna increase the property values for those four houses. So it, it's basically an in-place evolutionary development rather than coming in and scraping everything down and putting up a bunch of houses. Now, we circulate a petition and the text of the petition, I'll just read it. The underside residents request the streets of South Winston Lane, West Castle Lane, Hibiscus Lane, Foxhall Lane, and Foxhall Cove be designated in the zoning ordinances of Castle Hills as rural residential with a minimum lot size of one acre. Uh, existing lots of some acre size would be grandfathered at their present use. This is what people signed. And this was signed by over 60 residents of Castle Hills, including greater than 50% of the occupied property owners at one poor household, 49 of 92 occupied properties in a request of rural sanctuary. This is what the majority of the residents in this area want. And that doesn't mean that uh, slightly less than 50% don't want it. Just means they weren't home when we asked them to sign or we haven't seen them and so forth. So, you know, I think there's a, a really a, a groundswell here that is very basically tired of the many, many fights that we've had over uh, many bad ideas in that area. So with that, we'd uh, like to present, have the city council and uh, uh, approve the resolution that the uh, Zoning Commission undertake the study of the rural residential area. Now on the issue of uh, the one acre size, uh, the Zoning Commission at the last hearing, which the citizens agreed to, said that they were recommending now a 0.75 acre minimum size. And we find this agreeable, that this will serve to protect us as well. As well, although I haven't signed up for it, I'd just like to make one comment about the special use permits. As you, Saw from all the bad cases that we had, fully about half of them involved special use permits. So we're very much in favor of the uh, changes in the special use permits that have been uh, proposed as well in order to uh, 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 mitigate the, uh, those, those excessive fights on special use. And that's the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. Um, next up, we have uh, Ms. Ackley. Good evening again. I'm Jacqueline Ackley at 118 West Castle Lane. Stephen's been thorough. He had the materials to present that Quentin Baker helped collate, uh, as well as others in our neighborhood. I just want to kind of summarize and cap a few things. This area west of West Avenue involving the lanes Stephen named uh, probably developed as a happy accident of history. Um, because this was originally a rural area outside the city limits of San Antonio, 
and people had a few little hunting lodges out there. Not too many people came. There was no need for wide roads. Um, the density was low, so the runoff from big storms could be absorbed by the extensive green space surrounding the smaller homes that were there. And there was certainly no need for sanitary sewer septic tanks were the, the norm. So thus we have developed. But we're at an inflection point really where if we must kind of stop the development where it is because to allow for higher development, more densely placed homes, more impervious cover would then necessitate what could be a very big expense to the city as well as a big change to the residents of having to widen the streets, bring in sanitary sewer to the entire neighborhood and bring in and put in storm culverts throughout the neighborhoods adjacent to the roads. That's huge expensive as we know. So we would like to have council's permission to superimpose a rural residential district ordinance over this limited area. Of course, the exact boundaries of the area, the exact acreage, the exact SUP content of this rural residential ordinance need detailed perfection. And we expect that maybe it would be going back to zoning commission for those fine points. But your permission we seek to, to carry on with this project. Um, we are not, sometimes I think, well, probably the rest of Castle Hills think we're just asking for special favors. But I would make you realize that there are existential differences between the properties west of West Avenue and those that are not. And those are as the three main things, the narrow lanes, the uh, lack of storm drainage culverts to carry off storm drainage, and the lack of sanitary sewer. Those three things are quite unique in total, I guess there are some septic tanks east of West Avenue, but the sum of those three things are unique to that area of Castle Hills. It's intrinsically different kettle of fish. And pleasantly so, we have a dense tree canopy. We see a lot of wild animals in part because we're backed up to the McGimsey Boy Scout Ranch, but even a neighbor has called my attention and took photos of a, of a ring-tailed cat that she saw in her backyard and I go, what's a ringtail cat? I had to get on Google to find that out. They exist, they exist in Texas, but rarely seen, but we see them. We see a lot of other wild animals. And the area is a gem to all residents of Castle Hills or anybody in San Antonio who wants to take advantage of it. We get many walkers and bicyclers in that part of town, especially now with COVID, we're all getting out of doors to enjoy ourselves. And um, there's nothing keeping people from anywhere to come over there and enjoy it by walking and biking, and indeed they do. So we eagerly seek your permission to keep developing this concept of the rural residential district to preserve this gem that we have and uh, save it from fading away and probably saving the city a lot of expense in the future if, if we did change course over there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hackley. Do we have anybody else who would like to speak on the Mr. Bella? Council, uh, I'm still Peter Bella. I still live at 110. I'm not moving. But um, thank you again for your considerations tonight. Simply enough, you have heard the Ackleys speak in terms of the ongoing uh, difficulties that would be required that might incur costs to the city sewage infrastructure, stormwater drainage. I remember when we had this conversation during the Zoning Commission, I hope that uh, Chairman Solis is still available for his comments because one of the questions he said is, one of the points he made was that he didn't remember a meeting in which citizens actually sort of stood before the Zoning Commission or the council to say, we don't want curbs, we don't want wider streets, we don't want infrastructure for drainage, we don't want these things. He, and, and the chairman called Mr. Martinez up to the dais to, to ask him and, and uh, ask for his comments, is that really what they want? Is that really what the citizens want? We've come to a point where the area we live in is sort of in a certain sense starting to gel because the 
requirements for growth and greater density. That's the real nut. Greater density would require a change in how that area is. And that's why I think that it's a delight to find that that's the way it is, is what the citizens who live there really genuinely do want. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bella. Okay, if we have no further comments, uh, yes, sir. That's so I would just ask the uh, um, the council to uh, approve the recommendation, and, and really just for clarity. And uh, I, I know that our city attorney and, and uh, Chairman Solis will correct me, just so that I don't get another unfounded accusation of slander. But really, what I think is before the city council is whether or not, basically, to send this back for consideration to the zoning commission. It is not before city council to approve an RRD, but simply to send this back to the Zoning Commission to study it further, to make some additional recommendations, and then to present it back to City Council. And if I'm incorrect, please um, point that out to me. But I think that's where it's at. And I, I, would, I would support it. I'm not going to rehash all the points that have been made. They're great points. And it's a beautiful neighborhood, and I'm hoping we keep it that way. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martinez. Mr. May? Mr. Snow, you had a comment? Um, when the public is hearing is closed and you move to the next item, I'd like to make a comment before that item is under discussion. Yes, sir. Okay. If there's no further comments, uh, we'll close the public hearing at 821. Moving on to item number eight. Uh, discussion of possible action on recommendation from the Zoning Commission on amendments to the zoning ordinance to create a RR rural residential zoning district to include the used building area height area construction material fencing, vehicle parking and storage and other regulations for a RR rural residential district and possible adoption of ordinance 2021-01-12. Mr. Schnall. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor and members of the council, um, Mr. Martinez is not quite correct in his final comments. Um, th this uh, action and ordinance um, 2021-01-12 is um, an active request. It comes uh, with a recommendation from the Zoning Commission that Mr. Solis, I'm sure, will comment on further. But this is ready for action if the council so desires to create a RR Rural Residential Zoning District. If that is done, then the next step is for the City Zoning Commission to have a meeting to discuss and begin a process of identifying what parts or part of the city of Castle Hills, the zoning commission believes should be recommended to become rezoned into the RR zone. Um, and that is a process that will require um, public notice in the form of letters being sent to the owners of all property which is subject to the rezoning, plus all property owners of property within 500 feet of any of the properties that are subject to rezoning. So the Zoning Commission, if the council creates this district tonight, you're just creating a district with nothing zoned in it. You're just giving the Zoning Commission the opportunity to look into this in more depth um, and determine what areas are appropriate to be placed in this zone. We've heard a lot of comments from uh, Dr. Ackley, Ms. Ackley, um, Mr. Bella, Mr. Martinez, um, who, who's spoken um, articulately to the Zoning Commission and again this evening. Um, so we know what their interest is and, and I think that's very clear to everyone on the Zoning Commission. But the first step is create a zone, create a new zoning district and then as, as referred to, it would go back to the Zoning Commission and ultimately come back to the city council uh, when the zoning commission has a recommendation on which streets or which properties, which area would be um, recommended by the zoning commission to the city council for being rezoned, probably A to, to RR, but um, it's possible they may suggest that some properties not currently zoned A be part of the RR zone. Um, that's a zoning commission's um, job to do its work 
and bring something back to the council. Tonight, the Zoning Commission has done its work on the RR district. Um, there were at least two public hearings on this. Um, and I'll let Mr. Solis um, report that uh, to you in more detail. And I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Solis. Uh, Mr. Solis, you're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you, sir. Good evening once again. Uh, it is correct. We did have three public hearings in reference to this district. What we're recommending is the fact that what we fully understand is the beauty of Castle Hills is the different components that make up Castle Hills. And it's unique that we've been able to see. I will tell you, this was not a unanimous vote. It was 4-1 uh, was the actual vote on this recommendation that is before you for approval of a rural residential area district. Uh, for us, as I was saying, it, it's unique to find a rural area all of five minutes from an international airport, 30 seconds from 410. I, the need to preserve the uniqueness of Castle Hills is what is, for my estimation, what is taking place with this, this designation. There is more work to be done. I appreciate your council giving us more work to do, Mr. Mayor, but uh, we took this one on head first. There's still areas to be def defined. There's still lot sizes to be agreed to. There are a lot of other steps that we have to do and we're more than ready to be able to take that. That's why we brought forth for you an, an, affirm an affirmative recommendation to create the district, which allows us then to re-meet with the city uh, with the citizenry that are affected, those that are on the periphery, to understand what we're trying to preserve. Uh, from our perspective, you know, I've also had the opportunity to serve uh, on the Architectural Review Committee and have been in some of those battles for the preservation of this same area. Uh, and I look forward to being able to bring back that for you uh, with strong recommendations that are that, that, that will help preserve what is probably the most unique part of the north side of San Antonio, uh, where you're able to enjoy something uh, that is different. I appreciate the neighbors bringing forth their, their analysis, their concerns, their observations, but it is unique that they have already a petition of people that are looking for it. We will go ahead and listen to all of them once again, and make sure that everybody understands what they are agreeing to and what we have just, well, you know, to me, I've said this in the zoning commissions and I'm hearing there's a time for small government and there's a time for big government. In my estimation, what we're going to do here could equate to big government. So it's important that we do it in all transparency and public hearings that, were, that are worthy of something of this size. The timeline may be a little bit difficult as we look at it. If we're going to outline in terms of how many public hearings I may want to do on this, it may take us all the way to March. Uh, but we were able to move through uh, this one as well as uh, what you heard earlier pretty quickly by doing some public hearings where we met uh, a little bit more frequently to be able to listen as best we could and provide you a recommendation. Uh, right now, I will look at a March 1st recommendation or the month of March, whatever council meetings you have uh, in that time frame with a recommendation for you to formally adopt. And I am open for any questions that you may have, uh, as well as our city attorney. Uh, I look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Solis. Uh, and again, I appreciate you going the extra mile to ensure that we're getting feedback from all the citizens. I've uh, personally believe that the area west of West has a unique character that is only preserved through uh, thoughtful legislation and good government because if not, it, it will end up just like the city of San Antonio in certain areas where there is rampant infill development and lots are being subdivided to less than you know, 0.2 of an acre, which is not uncommon, uh, even with streets the size of Fox Hall. Uh, so I thank you for your thoughtful leadership on this and I'll see if any of my council colleagues have a recommendation. Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, I propose that we create a rural, an RR rural residential zoning uh, district uh, per the ordinance 2021-1-12. Thank you, Mr. May. Second. Second by Mr. Isbrand. Do we have discussion? 
Mr. Gregory. This is for Mr. Snow. On the uh, uh, section 50-391, it says you cannot rent the property out in this area. Is that a typical uh, part of an ordinance or is this going to be special to this rural residential area where a homeowner cannot rent his property out? I think that's a reflection of the Zoning Commission's sense um, that they received from the folks in the Fox Hall Lane area that the uh, nature of the neighborhood uh, makes it uh, inappropriate to have um, rental of property. Um, it's only the, uh, the sentence I believe you're referring to is the last one in 50-391A. And it, it says due to the limited capability to support increased traffic and parking, no property in this district may be rented for purposes of public assembly or used for such purposes on a frequent or regular basis. So it's a limitation, but not a prohibition. Um, and it was tailored um, to recognize that there may be circumstances where um, there, there may need to be some kind of a meeting once in a while, but this is designed to discourage a use in this um, area with narrow streets and drainage issues um, to be used to have, you know, large gatherings every night. Mr. G uh, um, Councilman Gregory, if I could, <clears throat> You brought up something that I think is very, very important when I talk about big government and small government. <clears throat> it's important for us in our public hearings that we have transparency for every single homeowner to understand what is being proposed and discussed. Because if for some, they're gonna, they're, they don't want to have that type of recommendation. This are, these points are starting points for us uh, and will be either reiterated, verified, or vilified. We will see as we go through these public hearings what the actual verbiage will be as we go through the public hearing. So there is still room for us to adjust, which is why we ask for the, the designation and then it will come back. But in the public hearings, people will have their opportunity to comment exactly on that one point if they so desire. So it's, um, you're establishing the district and the ordinance is basically a blueprint for a final ordinance? <clears throat> no, sir. This is the final ordinance. It's subject to amendment by the council on a recommendation from the Zoning Commission. I think what Mr. Solis is saying is that if during the public hearings that, that will come in the future, assuming again that Mr. Uh, May's motion is adopted, um, that, that after the Zoning Commission does its next round of public hearings, if they identify um, a, an issue that would merit consideration for amending this ordinance in the future, that's what they will bring back. But I consider this to be a product that has been publicly, ident publicly um, broadcast. Uh, the mayor uses the word transparency. I think Mr. Solis does as well, and I agree. This has been a very transparent process. The draft of this ordinance in its initial form was circulated as early as October. Um, I believe it was publicly available through the website um, either in October or November. Um, and, and the final version was in the packet publicly available before the Zoning Commission meeting last week um, and, and has been on the City Council and on the website again uh, after Mr. Rapley posted the packet on Friday of last week. So it's been out there a long time. Um, there was discussion of the very point you made asked your question about. Um, and so the, the commission did discuss it and ultimately was uh, comfortable with what you see as that last sentence in 50-391. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. A couple of nitpicky things, if I may, guys. First of all, I wanna congratulate Juan and the commission for doing such a great job on this thing. This stuff is not easy and you've had a couple of challenging issues as well along the way. So you guys have done a great job in the last few months, thank you. Um, but again, just to, to clarify the question that uh, Mr. Gregory asked on 5391 in that last sentence, does that mean that there's no Airbnbs? 
No, well, um, no, it, it does not because it talks about rent it for purposes of public assembly or those purposes on a frequent or regular basis. Um, it, it would not affect um, someone from registering a property under our new short-term rental ordinance, um, but um, it, it seems to me, and I think it probably seemed to the commission that in light of the quality of the homes and the neighborhood, um, it was unlikely that there would be a proliferation of STRs um, in, in the area, in the West uh, Fox Hall area, um, the area west of West Avenue, uh, for the most part, prim primarily because of the property values. Okay, thanks. Then on the, uh, the nitpicky stuff, 50-394, um, and this comment really, I think, applies to the zoning ordinance almost on the whole, especially with uh, districts A and AA anyway. And I'm, I'm talking about terminology with respect to building setbacks. And as an architect who sometimes goes into zoning codes to figure out how much room I have on a particular piece of property, I go into the zoning code looking for the building setback. And so sometimes we use that term, sometimes we use different terms. Uh, for example, with the front yard, it's, it's called a front yard of 50 feet. Then with the side yard, it's called the side yard setback. Then in the rear yard, you simply state that building and structure shall not be less than 20 feet from the rear property line. So it's a, you know, each, each condition has its own definition, kind of, if you know what I mean. So anyway, that's just a suggestion maybe to, throughout the um, code. And, and uh, Mr. Joyce, if I may, um, much of what you're seeing in, in 50-391 to the end uh, began with my looking at and copying the current ordinance for the A single family residence district. Right. And, and from that starting point, um, there were refinements made, um, particularly in the use regulations in 50-391 and in several of the subsections in 5394. Um, but but I, will, I, will admit it and I will admit and confess that 394 A, B, and C, I think you'll find are the same as what they are in the uh, comparable provisions for the A district. Um, uh, that's a job that the Zoning Review Commission worked on and then the Zoning Commission worked on and the City Council worked on when we uh, presented the comprehensive revisions to the zoning ordinance um, that took a, a long time to get to. But um, uh, if I'm involved in the future, I hear you and I think consistency is a good idea. And so we can take a look at that e even perhaps during this next go round on the RR district. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Schnall. And please don't take this as a criticism, just a suggestion for more consistency. Um, okay. Again, and then 5395, we get into that uh, chapter 3000 of the Texas government code. And I know you guys have listened to me on this issue before, but I, it just kind of worries me a little bit when we know that you can't uh, define a certain percentage of a certain material. And here we are with that 75% again. And, uh, you know, the use of masonry, other material, yes, it says that you have to go by the Texas government code, but I'd be inclined to think, let's not even mention it if it's not allowed by the Texas government code. But I'll leave that to you guys, you know better than I, but just as an architect looking for consistency, that, that pops out at me. Um, and then last but not least, let's see, right, where is it? 50-397 on the vehicle parking and storage uh, items. After item C, one and two, there's a statement about the city managers not issuing permits pursuant to this subjection for more than three inoperable vehicles for one, any one property. Um, if we're gonna create such a beautiful district, I wonder if, if one is enough or if we maybe don't even want any. Food for thought, guys. Uh, well, Mr. Joyce, again, a, a good suggestion, probably also taken from the A single family district. But if you, I, I, I will comment that the C1 and 2 basically say that 
these inoperable vehicles are not going to be visible, should not be visible from the street. And I know um, Mr. Rapley may remember exactly when, but it seems to me sometime, um, I believe last year, um, the city received a complaint from a citizen about an inoperable vehicle that appeared to be parked in a front yard. And our code enforcement people um, addressed that promptly. Okay, thanks. Council <clears throat> Councilman, if I can, I think one of the things that <clears throat> I fully recognize it, and so does the zoning commission is the checks and balances of everything else that we have as, as outlined right there. There's other manners that this isn't the be all end all, but there are other checks and balances like our code enforcement and other areas that we address uh, that, that we feel when complemented with this basis can be addressed. And I do wanna thank you also for your input as somebody who actually uses our, 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 our ordinances and our zoning commission um, you know, recommendations because you're, you're, you're part of our target audience, right? Those of them, those are people who are willing to build or to look at moving and, and doing something in Castle Hills, the ability for them to properly read simply what the sets back are, what the different things consistently is needed. So that practical view, I appreciate. Uh, and we will look at it also. So it's just readable that somebody doesn't have to be an attorney by trade just to understand what it takes to build safely in Castle Hills. Okay, do we have any, uh, Mr. Gregory? Um, if the councilman had objection on 50-395, which I think was a very good objection, now's the time to change it. I would think this is the time to eliminate at the end of Texas government code, put a period and then strike everything out into the last sentence. Similarly, on, on the section 50-397, number uh, under a heading of 4D, I think is a good point. Uh, more than three vehicles, should it be one? I would urge Mr. Joyce, if, and I agree with it, if these things should be modified, now's the time to do it. And uh, do you have such a desire? Well, yes, sir, I do. And um, I recognize this is a, a work in progress. And, um, but I do appreciate all the hard work that was put in there to come up with this language. But really and truly, I think at this point, there's no need to even go to the 75% uh, idea and the idea of masonry because you can't determine what materials are required or what percentage of a given material is required. We can't do that. Um, so my recommendation would be to, uh, to strike those areas. And as Mr. Gregory points out, to, uh, to limit non-working vehicles, you know, I'm recognizing they'll be invisible, but gosh, this is a, this is a premier area. I mean, we've, we've talked all night about the beauty of this and how special it is. And Ms. Ackley used the term existential with respect to this area. So, I, you know, I don't think we should have any inoperable vehicles on these properties, but maybe just for the sake of practicality, one would be okay. But three to me is too much. Mr. May. I, I made the motion uh, tonight, uh, not because I, I believe that every jot and tittle in the ordinance is correct. So I think what I would encourage my colleagues here tonight to do is do what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do an open letter, uh, submit it to the Zoning Commission about the problem areas. I'm, it's late tonight and I don't think we're gonna to get to any consensus. So I would just say that part of this has to do with aspirations for our whole community and what a quote unquote master plan looks like. And do we scoop in areas that we'd like to be transformed from maybe a block of asphalt into something better because it's obviously close to this rural district that we've been talking about. But I wanna leave that for another night and I'm gonna submit my recommendations uh, to the Zoning Commission directly. Mr. May, I think that'd be prudent uh, just because the magnitude of what we're talking about here. And I think it's also important that we get feedback from the citizens and that we're not over here governing by ourselves. Uh, Mr. Isbrand. And, and Mayor and Council, I just share Mr. May's sentiments as well. 
Um, as Mr. Schnall said, there are some things in this, this ordinance that are lifted from other areas of our code that perhaps need to be looked at as well. So I think every area of our city is pretty precious and special. And that if we think that there should no, be no operable cars or one operable car allowed, inoperable car allowed here, maybe we need to be looking at it other areas too. So I think what this discussion does is perhaps help to spark a review of some areas of our, of, of our code. And I think where we are tonight gives them at least the working framework to begin to go back, address the rural residential district and then also look at other areas that may need some refining along the way. Mr. Isbrand, if I could just tag on there, I would implore the zoning commission to consider when they're going through this process, what might be applicable to other areas of the city as well to Mr. Isbrand's point. I don't see any reason why we would have inoperable cars not be acceptable in the west of west area, but acceptable in other places of the city. I think we should hold all parts of the city to the same high regard uh, that being said, uh, Mr. May have uh, recommendation, Mr. Gregory. Uh, that's nice, but the city is divided into several different parts. And we recognize by establishing this district, some are different than others. And uh, I think it would be very, if Mr. Joyce wants to pursue it, I will second it. If he does do those modest changes right now, or else they may never be made. <laughs> they're they're going to be made when the zoning commission reviews this, Mr. Gregory. Well, I'll what I'll do is as Mr. May suggests and put my suggestion <clears throat> in the uh, zoning commission. Okay. May, may I just say one more thing about that? I, I appreciate the sentiment, Mr. Gregory. I do have the greatest confidence in the zoning commission. They have done very very good work. All of the recommendations, all of the work that they've done on this and other matters has been um, stellar. And when you watch the meetings, especially some of them that go really long, um, Mr. Chairman, um, it's quite impressive what they do. I think we can have the confidence that they will do the right thing. And we know that we will still have the final approval of any ordinance changes that come back to us. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Uh, Ms. Craig, can you read back the motion? We've been discussing so long, I already forgot what it was. Uh, or Mr. May, can you repeat your motion? We'll make it again for good measure. Mm. Mr. Mayor, um, I believe Mr. May's motion was that he moved to create the Rural Residential District and pass Ordinance 2021-01-12. Ah, thank you, Mr. Snow. And I believe Mr. Isbrand was a second on that? Yes, sir. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Council. Okay, proceeding on to item number nine. I conduct a public hearing on possible amendments to section 50-497 of the zoning code to revise provisions as to special uses in zoning districts and to add provision concerning special uses permitted in a new RR rural residential zoning district. It is 847. We're going to open the public hearing. And we don't have anybody signed up. So if you'd like to make a comment, let me know. Going once. Going twice. Oh, Mr. Bella. I believe simply enough that the citizens were supportive of the recommendations from the Zoning Commission. Thank you, sir. It is 848. We're going to close the public hearing and proceed to item number 10. Discussion and possible action on a recommendation from the Zoning Commission on amendments to section 50-497 of the zoning code to revise provisions as to a special uses in zoning districts and to add a provision concerning special uses permitted in a new RR rural residential zoning district and possible adoption of ordinance number 2021-01-12-A. Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to the chairman's release on the recommendation. 
Yeah, uh, Mayor and, and Council, again, once again, this is brought forth with a recommendation. It was 5-0 vote. Uh, we believe that we have been able to properly, if you will, put some flesh and some meat on some uh, on something that's very important as we just approved. We make the recommendation for the approval of you've already approved the rural residential district. We think this dovetails to have some continuity with expectations. I, I do want to mention before we get too far that the work of the city manager and their staff to allowing us to make good decisions, we can only make strong decisions based on the information that's provided to us. I know that was an issue earlier that was brought up. I've never had a doubt uh, on the validity of what is being brought forth to us, as well as the recommendations by our city attorney. So all around, the three of us get to make uh, the zoning commission, the city attorney, and the city manager bring forth to you solid recommendations based on the best expertise that we can provide for you to make the proper decisions for the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We move approval of this one also. Thank you, Mr. Solis. We appreciate uh, you, all of your work and as well as the commission. Uh, Mayor, uh, I would like to mention there should be a hard copy from Mr. McCormick regarding this agenda item. Uh, this year. Uh, we, is that a hard copy? You broke up there, Mr. Rapley. A hard copy of the ordinance? No, hard, uh, hard copy of, copy of Mr. Mr. McCormick's comments, Mayor. Okay. Got you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have a motion, Council? Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt ordinance number 2021-01-12-A as stated. Thank you, Mr. May. Mr. Joyce? I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Do we have a discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Council. Proceeding on to item number 11, discussion and possible action on ordinance number 2021-01-12-B, calling a general election for the city of Castle Hills, Texas to elect the mayor and two aldermen, making provisions for the conduct of the election, resolving other matters incident and related to such election, and providing an effective date. Ms. Craig. It is this time of year for y'all to call the general election. And this time we will be electing one and two council persons. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Uh, Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt ordinance number 2021-01-12, calling a general election for the city of Castle Hills. Thank you, Mr. May. We have a second by Mr. Gregory. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Council. And I'll remind you that I need to get you all to sign a document before you leave tonight. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Uh, item number 12, discussion of possible action on authorizing the city to enter into a joint services agreement with Bear County Elections Administrator for the May 1st, 2021 general election. Ms. Craig? Yes, sir. Uh, I do not have the contract attached because a little quirk in the government rules is that the county cannot prepare the contract until the closing period for the filing, but you have to adopt a contract to be able to have that done. So uh, Jackie Cal Allen will provide that as soon as she can. This is just to give uh, permission to city manager to sign the contract when it is available. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, I move that we authorize the city to enter into a joint service agreement with Bear County Election Administrator for the May 1st, 2021 general election. Thank you, Mr. May. Uh, second. second by Mr. Joyce. All in favor? Unanimous again. Thank you, Council. Item number 13, discussion of possible action on the creation of a governmental relations committee. Mr. Isbrand. Um, Mayor and Council, it struck me that given some of the changes and evolution of things that are taking place in the political or electeds world, that it would be worth a discussion of the establishment of governmental relations committee. As you know, the Texas legislature convened today for the next 140 days. As you know, we have uh, issues that we have brought forward to TxDOT regarding their plans for the, the uh, work on Loop 410 that may um, be beneficial to us to have our state senator, our state representative engaged in this process with us. 
we have a new county commissioner that represents us. Um, and, and we have relationships with the city of San Antonio and our neighboring council members. It seems that as our city has matured, if you will, in its processes and the way we conduct business, that it would be a value for us to have a, a committee that could serve as a unified voice for this council and the city in uh, having interactions with these other elected officials to advance the best interests of the city of Castle Hills. So um, I would be happy to make a motion tonight if you're in agreement of the value of this, um, but that's the purpose of bringing this one forward tonight. Thank you, Mr. Esbrand. Um, any, could you give us an idea what that motion might look like? Um, certainly, what I would um, offer is a motion to establish a governmental relations committee for the city council of the city of Castle Hills that would be comprised of the mayor and one member of the city council to be appointed by the city council. Thank you, Mr. Isbrand. Uh, was that a, I'm sorry, was that a formal motion? Do I need a second? Uh, no, well, that was, that was you asking me what it might be. I, I, I don't want to- It sounded like one to me, Mr. Isbrand. <laughs> well, I'll make that a formal motion then, but I, I would invite the discussion here if you see value to this, because I, again, I think we're at a point as a city where um, the, the kinds of relationships we have with uh, other electeds is really important to advancing the benefits of our city. I'll second it. Uh, second by Mr. Paul. Uh, we'll have some discussion, Mr. Gregory. Yeah, uh, Mr. Isbrand, is this similar to what Marcy Harper established years ago where various cities got together and discussed problems once a month? Um, no, no, sir, this is not. This would be representatives the mayor and a member of the city council who would on uh, behalf of the city council and the city um, interact and engage with uh, our elected representatives at other levels to, again, to advance our agenda. This is not the council of governments or uh, any, uh, anything similar to that. So what authority or power would they have they would have the direction from the city council to uh, have dialogue with the electeds for them to understand what the, the priorities, concerns, and issues are of the, of the city and to be able to solicit their uh, advocacy on behalf of the city where it's appropriate. I see, thank you. Mr. May? Uh, Councilman Isbrand, would you entertain an amendment to allow the appointment by the mayor of citizens who might be uniquely qualified to also sit on this committee? I, I would be willing to entertain um, any suggestions that you might have. I think it's just important that we have an effective um, unified voice for our city and have uh, the ability to work <laughs> with our, our colleagues in the political world out there. If to that end, uh, Councilman, in this community, we have retired judges, retired legislators, uh, retired, retired elected officials that have a continuing contact. I would move that as part of the governmental relations committee, the mayor has the authority to appoint additional members from the citizenry. Uh, okay, we have an amendment by Mr. May. Do we have a second? I'll second the amendment. Okay, we have a second by on the amendment. Mr. Gregory. Mr. Isbrand, what would be the benefit of that? <coughs> to have somebody not in the political arena to discuss with other cities po political problems. Is it an advantage or a disadvantage not to have somebody who has, shall we say, skin in the game? Um, that's it's an excellent question and Mr. Mayor why I hesitated when you did that I realized what your intention is which is obviously to tap into the best minds um, which we're not precluded from doing the mayor or any of us could you know go through that exercise now ourselves I think as the elected representatives of the city that my intention at least would be that we um, officially, if you will, speak for the city and that the elected representatives would 
be what this committee would be comprised of. Perhaps um, if there's language that would consider whether they be um, advisors that the mayor could select advisors to or something like that, it may be appropriate, but that when we represent this committee or this city publicly to other electeds, it's with our electeds. Mr. Isbrand, if I may, I, I can appreciate how we're trying to formalize a process because unofficially this is happening. If I have a question regarding something that pertains to uh, just completely random ceiling fan manufacturers and we have a ceiling fan manufacturing representative that lives in the city, I'm gonna rely on them to give us the best direction to help the city. So again, this is already happening, but this is formalizing the process and creating a process where one doesn't exist right now, which is I think what this council is trying to do to provide structure for a city moving forward. Uh, do we have any other comments, questions, input? Okay, if that's the case, then we will vote on Mr. May's amendment first. Is it anybody, everybody remember that? All in favor? All opposed? Okay, uh, amendment passes three to two. Uh, now on to the original motion as provided by Mr. Isbrand. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much, council. Uh, we'll proceed to announce by mayor and city council members on items of community interest. Mr. Isbrand. Oops. Mayor and council, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank um, the city manager, Chief Ladwig, Chief Siemens, the members of the fire department and police department who executed an incredible first responders parade just before the holidays. It was a, I think a smashing success. Um, and I'm not uh, unconvinced that the adults didn't enjoy it more than the children. Um, it was probably much needed relief and a, a little sense of happiness that we all needed. And it was, uh, yeah, very well done. And I certainly appreciate the, the work of the city staff to make that happen. I know our citizens do too. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Isbrand. Mr. Paul? Yes, I'd like to make a couple of comments about our committees. Uh, most citizens probably aren't aware of the benefit and the fine work that Chairman Solis previously, Chairman Isbrand, Previously, Jack Joyce, he ran the uh, uh, Architect Review Committee. Uh, currently, we have uh, Bruce Smiley Califf. We have Barry Middleman. We have had and have extremely knowledgeable, thoughtful people on these committees now and in prior times. And we are very fortunate being a small city to have that kind of talent. And I want to tell them openly again how much I really appreciate their work. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. May. Just one point. Uh, we are hitting all-time highs in new COVID cases per day. We've hit a, a, a shortage of the vaccine, yet there are a number of places that one can go to. Our residents, almost all of them, are going to be in 1A, one, one 1B, one and 1C. Within a short order. So, University Hospital is one place. The city of San Antonio has a website of where to go. There are a few clinics that have limited numbers, but it's still worth uh, an effort. Uh, Stamp is one of those. So, if you have not been vaccinated, I'm encouraging uh, all of everyone, any, whoever's listening tonight, I hope there's someone listening. Um, because we need, we need to outrace this, uh, this epidemic. Thank you, Mr. May. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to announce that uh, our comprehensive plan advisory committee is making progress on the plan, and we have just about ready a survey that we're going to be sending out to everybody through the various commissions and committees and so forth. And so please keep your eyes out for that in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we're looking forward to your responses and uh, continuing on down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joyce and Mr. Gregory. Uh, this council didn't have the privilege of serving with Helen Glass. She was a former council member serving, gave 
eight, 16 years of her life dedicated to the city as alder, alderman. And she passed this week. She was in her 90s. She was a good friend of mine. She, I think she sat in this chair, if memory serves me. And, uh, but she always asked very interesting questions. And um, uh, sorry to see her go, but she, was, uh, she served the city faithfully for many, many years. And I just wanted to note her passing. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Uh, and I wanted to echo a little bit on what each one of y'all said. Um, it's a tragedy with Ms. Glass, but we're fortunate to have had her a part of the Castle Hills family for so long. Um, her granddaughter reached out to me and uh, wanted to let us know. Um, Mr. Isbrand, to your point, uh, I think most of the people got the satisfaction were the people that were actually driving on the road as we were traversing the uh, residential areas and they started honking and they were really excited to see all the people during the holiday parade. Uh, Mr. May, you brought up the point about the COVID vaccines. I think it's a great idea to share information about that. One thing that I do wanna add that is a common misconception is that you can, if you're a resident of the city of Castle Hills, you can register at the Alamo Dome to receive the vaccine. That is not exclusive to San Antonio residents. Uh, Lastly, I wanted to add a couple of comments that Ms. Crawford with the Castle Hills Women's Club asked me to share. They're gonna be doing a blood drive on January 30th. The information is on the city website. If you could please uh, join right now more than ever, it's important. And lastly, they're collecting dues for the community organization. Uh, you can go to the city website and pay online there. That's huge part of what Castle Hills does is being a community and the community organization is great at putting on events and programming uh, regardless of what's going on. So please uh, consider paying your dues to be a part of the member and fund the experience for everybody. Uh, Mr. Rapley, you had a comment? Oh, man, I just wanted to say, uh, apologize if I've had any audio video technique. Not used to doing this Zoom and being there at a council meeting present. And so you're in good hands tonight with Mr. Daniel and staff and uh, appreciate allowing me to share. Thank you, Mr. Rapley. Okay, with that being said, Mr. May. I move that we adjourn. Motion on Mr. May. I second. By Mr. Joyce, all in favor? Okay, meeting is adjourned, 906. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Lakin, for joining us.